Once upon a time, in a piece of land far, far, far away from here, that was a little kingdom. So the people of this kingdom lived happily and harmoniously, and the wealthy relied mainly on three, three, things, three things, the rice fields, the mussel farms, and the fisheries. So every morning, the fishermen shouldered their nets and went by to the bay to catch some fish. So they knew exactly the best place to catch the fish. And that was where the waters were clear and were far from the rice fields. So that was on the southern part of the bay. They also knew about the importance of the habitat of these fishes. The sea, grass, meadows surrounding the bay. So, and they knew that the northern meadows were affected by the runoff discharges from the rice fields. And their aspects were quite different. So fishermen were really aware of the importance of preserving these habitats because that meant preserving their fish. However, over the last past year, over the last few years, an extraordinary and unexpected event happened. So a huge, huge dragon <laughs> coming down from the sky and with a burst of fire, as it was a heat wave, it hit the lands and the waters of the kingdom. But not only this kingdom, but all kingdoms around. So how the people of this kingdom were going to respond to that event? How the fishermen, how the fishes? And the most important thing, how the seagrass meadows, oops, both those from the north and those from the south were going to respond to that event. To that event. Well, I'm so sorry to tell you that this story has not ended yet, but the studies we have been performing during the last years, we, with these studies we are contributing to create an end for this story. So, my name is Neus San Martí, I'm the University of Barcelona, and uh, the work I'm going to present here is a master student's work, Tecla Maggioni, she couldn't come, she's from the University of Barcelona also. And this work aims to explore the combined effects of warming, simulating a heat wave, and eutrophication of functional traits of the seagrass, Cymodocyanodosa. So, our hypothesis, was that eutrophication and temperature acts synergistically with the deleterious consequence for the seagrass. So Cymodocyanodosa is a fast-growing species. It's distributed along the Mediterranean, the Eastern Atlantic, Madeira, and Canary Islands. And it has a very high phenotypical plasticity. In Alfax Bay, northwestern Mediterranean, our little kingdom, is distributed along the bay on the platform from zero to two meters, and the meadows from the north are receive the runoff discharge from the rice fields, while the meadows from the south were in environments more similar than the open waters. So this contract, these contrasting situations indeed is reflected in the water column, the sediment, and the plants. So in eutrophic environments, salinity was lower, the nutrients were higher, the organic matter in the sediments also was higher, and the nutrients on plants were also higher in eutrophic um, environments. So in order to explore these combined effects of warming and eutrophication, we took plants from the both contrasting side, plants and, and sediment from both contrasting, both contrast, contrasting sides, and expose it to three different temperatures, 20, 30, and 35. So to do that, we use um, three chambers, um, and we put three mm, mm, replicates of each condition in each chamber. So we let the plants to acclimate for seven days, then we gradually increase the temperature to 30 and 35 for seven more days, and finally, we decrease the temperature again to 20, to 20 degrees. So after each period, we measure photosynthetic parameters and we also measure growth parameters. 
So after the whole night of uh, dark adaptation, we measure maximum quantum yield. And after three hours of light adaptation, we measure effective quantum yield. So we also measure the relative shoot growth and shoot recruitment. So how these plants uh, did this, mm, respond after the exposure and after the recovery period? Well, on the graph on the top, you can see the exposure period. On the bottom, the recovery period. The y-axis are the response variable, and the x-axis the thermal uh, treatment. So gray bars are eutrophic plants, blue bars are oligotrophic plants. So maximum quantum yield after exposure period were lower in eutrophic plants and at 30 degrees compared to those from sorry here from 20 and 30. However, after recovery period were those from oligotrophic plants who show a lower values of maximum quantum yield at 35 related to 20 and 30. There were no differences between conditions um, at any period, exposure and recovery. So effective, effective quantum yield um, followed similar uh, patterns that maximum quantum yield. So after thermal exposure, eutrophic plants show a lower values of effective quantum yield at 35, related to 20 and 30 in also in eutrophic plants. And after recovery plants, again, were those oligotrophic who showed lower values at 25, lower values of effective quantum yield at 35, related to 20 and 30. Again, we found no differences between both conditions at any of the periods. So we also measure relative shoot growth. And the relative shoot growth after the exposure period, there, was, there were no differences at all between temperatures, treatments, between thermal treatments and conditions, as you can see here in, in this graph. However, after recovery, we saw a decrease of the shoot, um, shoot growth at 35 related to 20 and 30. No differences were, again, found between thermal treatment in oligotrophic plants. So to summarize the, oh no, after the end of the experiment, we also recovered, the, um, uh, we also measured the um, shoot recruitment after recovery period. And we saw that eutrophic plants, where uh, the recovery was higher than oligotrophic plants. And also at 35, the um, shoot recruitment was lower, related to 20 and 35. To, 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 to summarize all, the, um, all these results, so we see that at physiological level, um, oligotrophic plants show, showed a slight decrease um, at 35. However, that was not mm, reflected on growth parameters. However, in photosynthetic plants, at physiological level, photosynthetic parameters, there were no differences. And we found growth parameters that drop um, significantly and strongly at 35. So it seems that eutrophic plants um, are more affected by this heat imposed heat wave. And the relation between this combined effect of warming and eutrophication, well, it's not clear. So this, the reason of these, of these interactions is not clear. But and, and with this study, we have not enough information to talk about the reasons or to talk about the me mechanisms. But at least some of the processes should are, are, involved, are involved. So on the one hand, and oxygen the sediment. So it's, we know that eutrophication uh, increased the oxygen sediment and also increased the sulfide that it's potentially toxic for the plant. So that could be, could be worsened by the um, warming. And the photosynthet photosynthesis and respiration radio. So it could be that eutrophic plants could have less capacity to maintain and alter this radio and that could also be worsened by, by warming. Mm -hmm. 
so two conclusions we had from this work. First, Simon Rosiano-Dosa from chronic eutrophic environments was more sensitive and showed less capacity to overcome a warming event. And second, there, uh, as our results support our hypothesis, there is a synergy, synergistic effect between warming and eutrophication, at least for some growth parameters. So, take into account that this is a mesocosm experiment, indeed, and it has a lot of limitations. And in real scenarios in the field, the, the things would be different, of course, because there are a lot of much more variables and factors that are playing. But, well, after this work, we have a little bit more of information and knowledge about the effect of the warming and the eutrophication, the combining effects. So with this information, we can go to the fishermen and talk to them, to those fishermen from the kingdom, from our story at the beginning, and tell them that by the moment they can still fishing at the southern part of the bay, where the, clear, where the waters are clear and the seagrass meadows are able to cope with these extraordinary events. However, if these events increase in intensity and persistence, nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. So thank you very much. Questions. I would like to ask two questions. One is, what's the rationale for measuring both effective and maximal quantities? What's the difference between them? Yeah, well, yeah, no, well, you are the expert on, <laughs> on that, so I should ask you. We, in fact, we measure more parameters. We also measure um, relative um, ETR, yeah. and we also measure NPQ but I did not present this, this work. We are still processing some data from this work, and there is some data we have to analyze more as nutrients in plants or carbohydrates, so. But obviously the effective quantum yield will depend on the irradiance, so my second question is what, what, how much light were in this aquaria? It was a constant light. It was, I think, like 270 photons per, yeah, in each aquaria was constant. Quite high then. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you too. No. No, we, we increased the temperature gradually for, I, I guess we, it took one day, we gradually increased and then we let um, thermal, uh, thermal treatment for seven days. And then again we gradually down one day and let. Sorry? No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Thank you. Did you see any mortality in your. Any more? Sorry? Any, any mortality in any of the plants that I that you were. What's talent? Sorry? Uh, mortality. Death. Oh, death. Yeah, yeah. We see much death in, in new traffic plants. Yeah, more necrosis on the, on the leaves. Yeah. We did not present it. Yeah. In new traffic, there were, the, there were more death, more mortality. Yeah. Uh, lunchtime anyway, so thanks, Ben, and also thank you to all the students.